for the, the next um, edition of the Sign Ups Lecture Series. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Swanee Paul, uh, who is a consultant uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist in the UMS uh, LD service. Um, and this service is, in particular, um, serves severe and profound uh, um, intellectual disabilities across the whole of Essex. Um, Dr. Swanepoel also has a PhD in human physiology and a special interest in neurodevelopment, which is why I've asked her to give this talk, with also a, an interest in trauma and evolutionary psychiatry. So I will pass you over to her. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the talk today. And hopefully, as I said, it will generate lots of discussion points at the end. Uh, so many thanks, Annie, and I'll, I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation, Ben. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you all about something which I have found personally really interesting and useful, and that is understanding child development from an evolutionary perspective. Now, you might want to know why an evolutionary perspective, and that is because we used to ask when seeing a child, we used to ask what is wrong with a child? And that's a very uh, a focus being on pathology and psychopathology. And a trauma informed approach has helped us ask more about what happened to the child, thinking about the what they've been through. But when evolutionary view is different is that it helps us understand why children develop the way they do. It helps us to see which behaviors are pathological and which are adaptive strategies. So in other words, many of the children we see in practice have developed evolutionarily sound strategies to cope with a harsh environment. And I'll be explaining that a bit more. Recognizing this can help children, their families and their clinicians reduce shame and blame because it increases understanding. So an eminent evolutionary psychiatrist is Randolph Nessie, and he said the following. Psychiatry has emulated the rest of medicine by seeking causes and categories and biological mechanisms. But because it lacks the kind of functional framework that physiology provides for the rest of medicine, there is a temptation to conceptualize disorders in an essentialist way that oversimplifies reality. And mental disorders will be fully understood only when we can, as in the rest of medicine, understand pathology in terms of normal functions as well as normal mechanisms. And you will all know that when studying, um, as we've been doing for whichever profession we're in, part of that is learning the normal function of the body, physiology and anatomy. But in mental health, we tend to focus only on mental illness and not really think about anything um, which helps us understand better uh, what the healthy response would be. Nicholas Stenbergen has stated that to understand any biological response, we need to ask four questions. And these questions are, how does it work? And that's the mechanism. How did it develop? That's a developmental perspective. And these two, we are generally very good at because um, most of the research which you'll look at will focus on mechanisms um, on the cellular level, uh, on the organ level, on the intracellular level, neurotransmitters. So it's all about the mechanism. And then there's some research thinking about development, thinking which are the sensitive periods, um, thinking about um, the age at different ages where certain things are supposed to happen or where children might be more sensitive for particular things. So when we think about child mental health or pediatrics, we usually focus only on the first two questions. How does it work and how did it develop? An evolutionary view helps us to think further. So it asks us, it, or it prompts us to ask, how is this behavior adaptive? What is the survival value of this behavior? Why does this behavior exist? And then the fourth question, how has it evolved? So how does it compare to other species? 
And something which I think is really important is that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And biologists all recognize that. So whether they study plants or animals, um, all think about evolution. Um, but somehow, when we work with humans, we tend to not um, take that into account. And I think we're missing a trick there. So does evolution apply to humans? Yes. Each human alive today is the result of a continuous unbroken line of ancestors stretching back 3.5 billion years. Genetic traits cannot survive across generations if the carriers of these genes do not reproduce. So I'm just going to pause there for a moment because it can be confusing. Genes, um, if you think about the selfish gene, genes want to reproduce themselves, but they have to do that by creating bodies, which can then uh, reproduce to create genes again. So if we think about it from the perspective of genes, genes cannot survive unless the carriers of these genes, the humans, have reproduced. And natural selection means that the genes of those individuals who survive and who reproduce are propagated. I'm going to explain that a bit more, um, but it basically means that those who did not survive or who did not reproduce had no way of, bring, of keeping their genes in the gene pool. And that means that all of us who are currently alive have had ancestors who survived and reproduced. And then something which I had never completely understood is that there's no natural selection for happiness. So from an evolutionary perspective, evolution acts only on survival and reproduction and survival of the offspring to reproduce in turn. There is no selection for happiness. And from an evolutionary point of view, it is better to be alive, even if you're thoroughly miserable, than to be dead, because then there's no chance for your genes to be propagated. Now, again, when I speak like this, I don't mean that it's conscious. I don't mean that people um, think about that or, or um, plan it. It's more that it's true in retrospect. People who are currently alive have all had ancestors who have reproduced, who have um, survived. So it's a question of shifting perspective to understand it. And in this talk, I want to introduce you to some evolutionary concepts, four really. The first is parent offspring conflict. And that is that what is best for parents is not always best for a particular child. And this conflict can explain a significant amount of parental child abuse and neglect. And then we're going to speak about the others um, as we can go on. So to think about parent offspring conflict, parents, particularly mothers, had to make difficult choices when resources were scarce. And that is still the case in many places of the world. For many mothers throughout our evolutionary past, it was not possible to provide for all their children. And sometimes newborns were left to die when older siblings had not been weaned yet. Um, some of you might know about Kwashiorkor, where the older child um, becomes malnourished when a baby is born and the mother then uh, feeds the baby and the older one is weaned. And mothers had to make and have to make difficult choices if there's not there aren't enough resources for all the children to survive. So if you imagine being a mother who has limited calories, limited resources, and who can only breastfeed one child that is pregnant and a newly born it arrives who can't be provided for, sometimes those mothers who try to feed both children would have both children die. And therefore, the mothers who did whatever it took to have a surviving child 
sometimes had to allow one child to die. That doesn't mean that it was easy for them, um, and I'm sure that it definitely wasn't, but it does mean that a baby whose mother was not committed to their care was in life-threatening danger for the most part of our evolutionary history. And even maternal preference for a sibling could result in death. Now, babies nowadays who are born now have no way of knowing whether that is true or not. And for most of the babies we will see that isn't true. They will survive even if their mother isn't committed to their care, hopefully um, through other services being involved and perhaps other family members. And we try to create a safety net. But the point that I'm trying to make is that those babies who responded in ways to keep their mother's attention and care and therefore survived and reproduced are the ones who became our ancestors. So this explains why babies are so demanding and also why sibling rivalry is so widespread. Because babies who didn't scream, who didn't insist on being cared for, had a gr greater chance of being left. Um, there is certainly some research which shows that babies with a difficult temperament um, have a bigger chance of survival um, in situations where resources are limited. Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species, and he said in that writing that as many more individuals of each species are born, that can survive, and as consequently there is a frequent struggle for existence, it follows that any being, if it vary, however slightly in any manner profitable to itself, under the complex and sometimes varying conditions of life, will have a better chance of surviving, and thus be naturally selected. And from the strong principle of inheritance, any selected variety will tend to propagate its new and modified form. So there are two points I want to make here. The first is that he said, as many more individuals of each species are born than can survive. And reading about Charles Darwin, he was really struck by the brutality of nature, where young ones are produced in abundance with the knowledge that not all of them will be able to survive, if you think about nature and that those who have got some um, random genetic variance which gives them an advantage might then survive more easily and uh, be more successful in having children who also survive and therefore those genes are then naturally selected and remain in the, the population whereas those who have a random mutation, which is a disadvantage, uh, would be more likely to die out. And that, that means that over long periods of time, the genes change um, in order to reflect uh, what adaptations work best in a given environment. So if you come across these ideas for the first time today, it might be a bit confusing. Um, and I think the most important thing is to remember none of this is implied to be conscious. Uh, it's just the way things work. And Charles Darwin recognized that. So the second evolutionary concept I want to talk about is life history theory, which states that in harsh conditions, there is a trade-off between short-term survival and reproduction at the cost of longer-term health and happiness. And if we think about slow life history, so some species are more inclined to have a slow life history, some others have a fast life history, and I want to bring us to thinking about people and humans where there's a spectrum. So thinking about elephants, they're a good example of slow life history because these individuals defer reproduction 
they tend to have fewer offspring in whom they invest considerable resources. So the focus is on quality. And this is in adaptive in a benign environment. So elephants generally are in a benign environment in the sense that there aren't any predators. And therefore they have um, the, and, and I know there are hunters and so on, I'm talking in, in a, from an evolutionary point of view, how things would have been millions of years ago. Um, so elephants would have um, been able to survive for long periods of time, which means they wouldn't have to have such an abundance of young in order to have some surviving offspring. And if there are just a few young ones, there is the capacity to invest an awful lot of time um, into them. And, and to give them all the resources that is needed. And this is adaptive in a benign environment because you don't need lots and lots of young ones in order to um, have the surviving ones into adulthood and into reproduction because it's benign, there are very few predators and they are likely to survive. If we contrast that with fast life history, these individuals begin reproducing at a young age, tend to have more offspring, each of whom who gets relatively little nurturance. So the focus is on quantity rather than quality. And this is more adaptive in harsh and dangerous environments. So thinking about rabbits, we know rabbits have lots and lots and lots of young ones. And it's important for rabbits to do that because there are so many foxes around um, and predators who catch their little ones. So for rabbits to survive and have at least some of the little ones grow to adulthood where they can also propagate, they need to be a lot of them. And again, I want to make the point that this isn't conscious. It's just that if there had been rabbits who only had one little baby who they invested a lot of quality um, time in, and that little baby was caught by a fox, the gene pool would have died out. So it's it's not a, a conscious strategy, but it is a strategy that works in a harsh and dangerous environment. And that doesn't mean that either the focus on quantity or the focus on quality is right or wrong. It depends on the context. So if we think about um, adverse childhood experiences, we know that they come from um, adverse community environments. So poverty, discrimination, um, lack of opportunity, poor housing, violence, and that leads to domestic violence, homelessness. Again, I'm not saying this is cause and effect, but association, mental illness, divorce, neglect, abuse, and that's how you then get the adverse childhood experiences. As long as the children don't die and grow up to be able to have their own children, this will continue. And one of the reasons is that there's intrauterine programming. So dangerous environments would likely lead to a fearful mother who is less able to provide sensitive and warm care. And fetal programming prepares the infant for the type of postnatal environment it is likely to encounter. So early experiences calibrate the HPA axis to shape fear reactivity, resulting in hypervigilant and fearful young. And then the key thing is this is adaptive in a dangerous environment, even if it causes considerable suffering. So a baby um, who is born to a mother who's suffering domestic violence, for example, who is in a desperate situation and is fearful, will be in the uterus exposed to the mother's stress hormones. This prepares her baby for um, the type of postnatal environment that it will encounter, so being in a high stress situation, and makes the baby become very hypervigilant for danger and to um, be more fearful, which is adaptive 
in that particular environment. Um, if you just imagine if a child had no fear in a really dangerous environment, this child would be at much greater risk of being hurt because the, the child wouldn't run away, wouldn't hide, would, wouldn't be hesitant to trust anyone. So even if it is, um, it causes considerable suffering to be fearful and to, to trust no one, this is adaptive in a dangerous environment. And this slide is just a slide to, to show how everything is interlinked. Um, because my other interest, which I didn't mention previously, is psychoneuroimmunology um, and the immune system, the neurons, the endocrine system, all of it is linked and all of it works together in order to give the individual the best chance to survive in a given environment. So early life adversity leads to the epigenetic programming of the stress system. This leads to an altered stress system, which leads to altered behavior and also increased inflammation, impaired immunity, um, accelerated aging, and a higher risk for psychiatric, cardiovascular, and chronic inflammatory disorders, such as allergies, asthma, and autoimmune disorders. So what I'm talking about isn't just mental health problems, but physical health problems as well. And the pediatricians amongst you will know that we uh, see a lot more physical health problems as well in children who are in adverse conditions. So you may have seen this pyramid before where adverse childhood experiences lead to disrupted neurodevelopment, social, emotional and cognitive impairment, adoption of health risk behaviours, and then earlier disease, disability and early death. But we aren't going to be able to change anything about this um, from an evolutionary point of view um, because as long as people are still able to reproduce um, and their offspring survive, we are caught in a vicious cycle. And the third thing, uh, evolutionary concept I want to expand on is the goodness of fit or conditional adaptation. And that is that successful survival depends on the ability to predict and adapt to environmental demands. So for example, in harsh environments, it is adaptive to trust no one. And you pro have probably all heard of attachment theory, which was developed by John Bowlby and taken further by Mary Ainsworth. And attachment refers to the bond of the infant to its primary caregiver, usually the mother, and later towards meaningful others. And this bond is necessary for mammalian newborns who cannot survive by themselves. Close proximity to the mother protects against predators and provides a secure base from which the infant can explore and return to if frightened. And it's important to note that children can form multiple attachments if given the opportunity. So attachment doesn't refer to the child, but it refers to the bond between the child and the adult, the caregiver. And Bowlby was a fan of Darwin's, and I don't use that word lightly. Bowlby wrote an autobiography, no, sorry, a biography of Charles Darwin called A New Life, uh, which is absolutely wonderful. And if any of you are interested in um, evolution and Bowlby and Darwin, I would highly recommend it. And Bowlby writes in the introduction, I found myself captivated by Darwin as a maturing personality and gifted scientist and also by the large extended family in which he grew to manhood, by his devoted wife and their numerous children, by his circle of scientific friends and colleagues, in short, by the whole drama of his eventful, troubled and extraordinarily productive life. So Bowlby was well versed in evolutionary thinking, and that is what led him to attachment theory. Now, we know that where mothers have enough physical and emotional resources, 
they can provide sensitive and responsive care. And in adults, we call it an autonomous style. And in infants, they then develop a secure attachment. And such individuals come to believe of themselves to be of worthy of care and others as capable of caring for them because that's been their experience. They have been cared for and others have managed to do that well. So they develop a secure attachment and they feel that they deserve help and they don't hesitate asking for it if they need it. But, and this is a big but, Nature does not prepare babies only for the optimum, where they are loved, wanted and sensitively cared for. Children develop attachment relationships even if their caregivers are rejecting, inconsistently sensitive or abusive, because if they don't, they die. And that means that those children who didn't aren't our ancestors. So we are absolutely dependent on the fact that babies do develop these attachment relationships and make the best of whatever care they are given. So Mary Main proposed that the attachment system would need to be capable of calibration to a variety of environments, favorable and adverse, and that sensitive caregiving is optimal and the provision of a secure base would help a child to explore and learn However, less sensitive caregiving could be expected to elicit responses that would support survival even in adverse conditions. So I've spoken about the autonomous secure style. Let's think now about the insecure anxious avoidant attachment. So mothers who are dismissive of their infant have babies who learn to become as independent as possible in order to not antagonize a rejecting mother. And these children develop an avoidant attachment, which is characterized as being compulsively self-reliant and to not show their stress, which is why I've got this picture of um, a cowboy. Mm. And it is important to recognize that this is not pathological and is adaptive in the environment the baby grows up in, because if they can act in a way to not annoy their mother um, and get as much care as possible, they can grow up to have their own children. And that is where, how um, evolution acts. The third category is insecure, anxious, ambivalent attachment. And this is where intrusive or inconsistent caregivers who are preoccupied um, themselves, have children who develop an anxious ambivalent attachment style and they, these children become compulsively care-seeking. And once again, this is not pathological and is a style which allows children to get the most care they can from a caregiver who is able to provide good care at times when given lots of prompts by crying or whining or clinging. Okay, so this is again not pathological, it is adaptive. Disorganized attachment is more difficult to know whether it's adaptive or not. Main and Solomon described the fourth style, which they termed disorganized, as these children would use unusual and odd ways of engaging with their caregiver. So typically in the strange situation when reunited with their mother, they might freeze or they might walk backwards or they might go towards her and then go under her chair. Um, so acting in ways that were, were unusual. And the disorganized category is prevalent in psychiatric patients. So about 90% of psychiatric patients have a disorganized attachment. And it is associated with care by a fearful or frightening caregiver whose own childhood is unresolved. So it's important to note that a caregiver who is frightening might be somebody who is abusive um, towards the child, but a caregiver who is fearful, who might have PTSD, who might have um, flashbacks and suddenly freeze, uh, dissociative episodes. This is very scary for a child. But so, and a child can develop a disorganized attachment even if the parent has never been abusive. 
they've just suffered their own PTSD. So um, I'll mention that a bit later as well. So Sarah Hurdy has argued that in previous times, children would not have survived such adversity. So children who were born to parents who were not able or willing to look after that particular child at that particular time would probably have died. Um, and it is perhaps only now that these children have got a safety net to a certain degree and um, are able to survive more. Um, but John Haltigan has argued that freezing or attentive immobility is a functional response which allows a protective role in high-risk contexts in which caregiver behaviour might be potentially harmful. And he's also said it is conceivable that in high-stress situations, risky last resort strategies, these odd strategies uh, which we see, may be adaptive in exploring alternative coping mechanisms to hopefully find a behaviour that reduces the risk to the child. And I want to make it very clear that none of what I'm saying is blaming of mothers or, or of other caregivers. And that is really important to take note that it really takes a village to raise a child. And the involvement of a father in child rearing has beneficial and distinct effects on the child's neurobiological maturation and on the development of social competencies, particularly in the child's capacity to manage aggression. And multiple caregivers and a network of attachment relationships have been found to constitute a protective factor in child development, with secure attachment to one person buffering the implications of insecurity in other relationships. And this is key. So a child who's suffering terribly at home, who might have uh, very um, difficult relationships with family members, but has a secure attachment of care with a teacher or with a social worker um, or with a, a distant family member or with a friend, it can make all the difference. It can really buffer the implications of insecurity. And these children can even become later on become um, earned secure. So adults can also become earned secure um, through therapy or through um, good relationships as adults. And in many cultures, grandparents are particularly helpful in contributing to children's survival and helping them thrive. And what um, children develop is these internal models of how the world works. So in a benign environment where parents are well and have adequate support, they will provide sensitive and responsive, uh, responsive care. And children will adapt to be open, trusting and able to accept help and we will say they are securely attached. If parents are stressed due to ill health, poverty, or having less social support, they may be less able to provide consistent care. I think all of us know that too. Even if we have all the advantages in the world, if we have a, a bad mood or something annoying us, we are just not as good parents as we might usually be or might want to be. So these children will adapt by becoming compulsively self-reliant, avoidant, or clingy and compulsively care-seeking, the ambivalent attachment. And these children will have highly activated stress systems, mirroring their parents' stress and adapting to the more stressful environment. And we know that chronic high stress levels contribute to mental and physical disorders later in life. However, it does not inhibit reproduction and thus the cycle is perpetuated. We get the intergenerational transmission of um, trauma unless the environment changes. And this is really key. A recent consensus statement uh, by all these different authors has said that unless the world is successfully engineered to become a responsive and safe place with plenty of resources for all of its inhabitants, 
it may not be justified to consider only secure attachment relationships to be adaptive for all individuals. And just to remember when thinking about attachment theory, Donald Winnicott said, there is no such thing as a baby. There's a baby and someone. So attachment is about a particular relationship. It is not child specific. And the focus on attachment can unhelpfully legitimate a narrow focus on the mother child relationship and the responsibility of the mother for the relationship, directing attention away from the family, socioeconomic context, the availability of social support and potential neurodevelopmental issues experienced by the child. And some children are genetically more difficult to care for due to their temperament and due to um, neurodevelopmental disorders or physical illnesses. And there are genetic reasons for resilience. Not all individuals are equally sensitive to the environment. This is again, I'm saying this in order to avoid blaming parents. So with resilience, um, for those of you who haven't heard of this, um, if you think about dandelions and orchids, dandelions are flowers which grow everywhere. So they don't need to be planted. They don't need to be tended. They grow when there's drought. They grow when there's rain. They grow in good um, soil. They grow in cracks and uh, in the pavement. They are resilient. Compare that to orchids. Now, I don't know how you are uh, in terms of tending orchids, but I uh, struggle. I don't have much luck with them because you need to get it just right. They need just the right amount of light, the right amount of water. Um, it, if, you, if you do, and, and of course they don't just grow anywhere. So they are sensitive little flowers. And with children, and all of us really, it's the same way. You might want to think about yourself. Are you more a dandelion or are you more an orchid? And all children so, show some degree of adaptability, but some are more sensitive to the environment effects than others. And we call that the differential susceptibility. And we know that there are some genes that have been implicated, for example, the serotonin transporter and dopamine receptor genes. And the way to think about this is that nature doesn't put all her eggs in one basket. Okay, so if the environment is going to stay um, the same, oh no, let me put it this way. If the environment is harsh, then you want some um, individuals to be resilient in order to, to manage that. So the dandelions, if you look at the graph, uh, where the dandelions are, regardless of whether it's a negative environment or a positive environment, the dandelions are fine. And we all have seen that. We've seen children who live in families uh, of where there are desperate um, difficulties and some children just seem to pull through. They are fine. They seem not to be affected. They are little dandelions. Whereas other children are like orchids. So in a negative environment, they do very badly and they struggle. But it's not just a vulnerability because in a positive environment, these little orchids can do exceptionally well and even outperform the dandelions. So that is why it exists, because being an orchid makes you more sensitive to the environment. It gives you a disadvantage if you happen to be in a harsh environment, but it gives you an advantage if you are in a good environment. Whereas as a dandelion, you're OK regardless, but you're not going to be as brilliant as the orchids are. And I think this is very important um, specifically from a psychiatric perspective, because I believe that all the children we see, or just about all of them, are little orchids, because the dandelions are the ones who are fine. They they end up being okay, um, pulling through. They don't end up seeing a, a specialist in a um, scam service, whereas the ones that really struggle are the orchids. And that means that 
they have got this tremendous potential that if we get the environment right for them, they can do so well. And the last evolutionary concept that I want to just briefly refer to is mismatch. So where current environmental demands do not fit with what we have evolved to cope with. So an evolutionary mismatch occurs when the environment in which an organism lives is significantly different from that in which it evolved. So traits that were once adaptive may then become pathological. And the prime example is that throughout evolutionary history, food was scarce. It was difficult for hunter gatherers to get enough uh, food, to gather or to hunt enough food, and famines were widespread and common. So those who had the ability to eat when there was food available, who had the um, capacity to store that extra calories as fat uh, in order to use when the next famine came around, those are the ones who survived and who reproduced and whose genes are in the gene pool. And now, in our current situation, where there's plentiful, cheap, high calorie food available for the first time ever in evolutionary history, this leads to widespread obesity because we have been adapted to survive through famines and food scarcities, but we haven't adapted to survive in um, abundance situations. And this leads to widespread obesity. That is one reason why blaming the individual is so uh, counterproductive, because what we need to do is to change the environment uh, rather than saying each individual needs to change themselves. And I have previously given a talk uh, which is on YouTube about ADHD as an evolutionary mismatch. And just as a, a short um, example, if we think about children, um, in our evolutionary past, children uh, were never expected to sit still for hours each day, for most days of the year, and concentrate. Never. This is very, very recent and unusual in our evolutionary history. And children aren't um, adapted to do that, particularly the ones with um, ADHD, or what we now call ADHD. I'm sure that in previous times, those children would just have been the more active ones who ran more, climbed more, played more. But now in our current environment, in schools, they are the ones who get in trouble because they don't sit still and they move around the whole time. So these children are caught in an evolutionary mismatch. So to conclude, the pathway that described a secure attachment with a slow life history is more adaptive in a safe environment. In a dangerous world, the pathway described by insecure attachment predisposing to fast life history is more adaptive in terms of survival and reproduction, even if it does create genuine suffering. And not all individuals are equally sensitive to the environment. This is genetically determined to a large extent, whether you're a dandelion or an orchid. And further research into epigenetics and differential susceptibility may inform our thinking about which treatments might work best for specific patients. And acknowledging the importance of the early environment creates the potential to improve clinical outcomes. For example, by increasing the resources given for parenting programs and adequate social care. An evolutionary view can give us a more sophisticated approach to psychopathology, enhancing the possibility of intervening both appropriately and with greater compassion. Understanding the evolutionary context can help patients decrease shame and blame. And I just want to thank my co-authors um, on which this talk is based. And thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much, Annie. That was such an interesting and insightful talk. Um,
I've written quite a few notes from it because it's just fascinating. I find it particularly fascinating. I think first thing would be the, the, the concept you raise about there being no natural selection for happiness, which is an intriguing point, point of thought. But particularly my interest, which is in this intrauterine programming, which you talked about, and the idea of the stressful in utero environment, the, the cytokine storm that exists with stress and, and uh, adverse events in, in during pregnancy, and the effect it has on the unborn child, the effect it has on the hypervigilance that you describe, so priming the child for life outside the womb, where that be that um, uh, an increased sensitivity to the HPA axis, so the stress response, and uh, how that relates to other organ systems such as the immune system. So these children also have hyper a tendency to have a hyperactive immune system. And as we've talked about in previous lectures here, the role of the immune system actually on brain development generally. So you have a whole cohort of children who are now being born who are hyper responsive to the environment. So they have uh, the sensory profiles that we discussed last month with, with the insular interoception. Children are profoundly sensitive to hearing, hearing to touch. 